All right, we're back for round two here. So we're going to continue talking about Ronald Reagan, his legacy, and a little bit of foreign policy, and then try to get into his successor and how and do the beginning of the George, the first George Bush presidency. So without further ado, Reaganomics, was it successful? Well, I mean, it depends on who you talk to, right? In some ways, it spurred economic growth. It definitely ended stagflation. It uh, increased the American economy eventually after a series of recessions. Uh, you know, he took, he got rid of price controls, uh, deregulated the airline industry. And so they're, uh, you know, they're going to consolidate pretty significantly, which, you know, on the one hand, good. And on the other hand, you know, potentially good and that airlines are more profitable. On the other hand, you know, I don't know, last time planes just keep, uh, they keep packing more and more people in to try to make more money. And that feels pretty terrible if you're actually flying. So I don't know. Deregulation, was it successful? Y yes. Yes. No? Uh, you know. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there's a series of problems, right? I mean, the payday loan industry explodes, which, you know, problematic. Uh, Reagan uh, allows Native Americans to uh, open up casinos, which, you know, great for Native Americans who have casinos, uh, bad for anyone who likes to gamble. Uh, we have uh, our infrastructure starts to become more problematic. Uh, pollution becomes a larger problem as he's not enforcing environmental regulations. Uh, schools, spending cuts in education lead to falling educational standards. So I don't know. I mean, in the end, I think the way you judge Reagan and Reaganomics comes down to your political persuasions and what you believe the role of government should be. So uh, we do get immigration reform under Reagan, which most people would argue is positive. So illegal immigration had become a significant problem by this point. And uh, demographics had, of course, changed rapidly since uh, immigration reform in 65. So what Reagan does is, on the one hand, he provides amnesty for people who are in the country illegally. So if they come forward, if people come forward, they can uh, get a legal right to stay in the country. But then he's going to significantly step up enforcement for people currently trying to come here. So is this good? Uh, I mean, again, it depends on your political persuasions. So uh, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, amnesty to uh, 1.7 million Americans, and significantly stronger sanctions against people who hire illegal immigrants. So, yeah. Again, depends on, your, on what you, your policy uh, priorities are. Uh, we also get significant deficits, which Reagan really ran on balanced budgets, and then 100% did not deliver on balanced budgets. Tax cuts, tax cuts, uh, cut federal revenue, federal spending increased, and you know, just like every politician promises, like we need to, you know, tighten our belts and live within our means, and then they become president, and before you know it, you know, trillion dollar deficits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Reagan's deficits never got that high, but. Really, no one has effectively, the only president who's balanced the budget in recent memory was Clinton for a short period of time. And then, you know, back to massive deficits again. As far as foreign policy goes, as we mentioned before, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was much more aggressive in his fighting of communism. And so, uh, and, you know, so when a leftist regime takes over uh, in Argentina, uh, launches an assault on the Falkland Islands, uh, we back Great Britain in that conflict. In Lebanon, our embassy is bombed, uh, partially because of our interference in the Lebanese civil war. And so we uh, step up interventions in the Middle East in order to try to deal with the threat of terrorism. Uh, this was the first massive terror attack to affect Americans, I believe, uh, by foreign terrorists. Uh, we invade the island of Grenada. Uh, it's an island in the Caribbean. I think it's pronounced. Anyway, uh, island, it doesn't matter. In the, well, I mean, it matters to them, of course, but not, not for the purposes of this lecture. Uh, it's, w the government is overthrown. We're convinced it's a, cu a Cuban slash Russian backed coup. And so we invade a tiny Caribbean island. And as you can see here from this pro Reagan comic book, they're incredibly grateful that we went in. And no information has ever been released about how many people were killed. So mission accomplished. You're, thanks, United States. Uh, we get involved in the Iran-Iraq War uh, right after, uh, I don't know, maybe your world history class covered this, maybe not. But right after the Iranian Revolution, Iran went to a war with Iraq next door. Uh, Iraq had a, Iran, of course, radical Islamic 
uh, Republic, Iraq, secular Arab dictatorship. And so they have this really, really unpleasant, protracted, decades-long war, which, of course, uh, we were formally supporting Iraq and uh, the leader of Iraq, America's best friend, Saddam Hussein, who you might be familiar with. But it turns out we were also secretly selling weapons to Iran because we didn't really want Iraq to become too powerful. So, yeah. So in a protracted, almost decade-long, incredibly bloody, indecisive, not indecisive, um, oh, um, there wasn't a clear winner at the end, war in the uh, Middle East, we sort of backed both sides. And Reagan's dealings with Iran might have been secret, and they might have been illegal. So, yeah, that's the Iran-Contra scandal. And that we were secretly selling weapons to Iran, despite the fact that we had a formal ban on selling weapons to Iran, and we were yelling at everyone else about selling weapons to Iran. Turns out, uh, yeah. And so the thing about the Iran-Contra thing is, the question, of course, is always, what did the president know and when did he know it? So Reagan had a series of denials. His story changed over time. Uh, We still don't know what role Reagan had in the whole Iran-Contra thing, because on the one hand, you know, he's... On the one hand, you know, of course, very staunchly uh, sort of a hawk on foreign policy. And on the other hand, by the late Reagan years, he was suffering from dementia to some extent. It's a lot of people kind of gave him a pass on this. Plus, incredibly likable. So the whole thing sort of bounced off him. And, uh, you know, he was able to, on television, maintain his uh, com- his com- uh, composure and uh, likability. And his national security advisor, Oliver North, uh, took the fall. And said that he had authorization, but then, you know, the records were shredded. And in the end, no one, we still, to this day, I don't think really know, like, exactly who was responsible for the illegal weapon sales to Iran. Oh, and we were, um, (laughs) we were using the money for the weapon sales to Iran to fund death squads in Nicaragua. That's the whole contra piece of it. So uh, there was a leftist regime in Nicaragua. And so we were funding, uh, you know, right-leaning paramilitary groups who were uh, fighting a brutal civil war. So, yeah, that, that's a thing that happened, too. For the election of 1988, of course, Reagan can't run again. So he's going to uh, leave office and sail gracefully off into the sunset. And so we're, what we're going to get instead is Reagan's hand-picked successor. Well, not hand-picked successor, really didn't really mind that much. But um, his vice president, George Herbert Walker Bush. So there's George Bush here. The Democrats are going to nom- nominate Mike Dukakis, who is the governor of, of Massachusetts. So Dukakis versus Bush. Um, honestly, one of the things that crushed Bush was his choice of vice presidential candidate, a guy named Dan Quayle, who was a young evangelical who had a uh, habit of saying incredibly foolish things in public. So here's one of them. But probably the best one is when he uh, went to an elementary school and um, misspelled the word potato on the board by putting like an E at the end of it. So yeah, Bush was a likable enough guy, but he wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't a darling of the evangelicals. So he put Quayle on the ticket. And then for a lot of people, there was some concern about Dan Quayle potentially becoming president if Bush died because it's like, yeah, not the president. So Mike Dukakis, unfortunately, is Mike Dukakis. And he struggled to connect with anyone. Uh, Here's a picture of him in a tank showing how tough he is. Man, it doesn't really work. And the Bush campaign resorted to some really, really sort of a brutal negative advertising, most famously the Willie Horton ad. Uh, the, Willie Horton was a convict who was, who was um, released on a furlough program, on a work, work release program, who ended up committing more crimes and, kill, and killing people. And, yeah. and uh, so Bush ran an, a series of ads painted Dukakis on soft, soft on crime. And there was some clear, like, no race baiting going on here. And so all of that paid in, played into Dukakis' eventual defeat by Bush one handily. So here's your results of 88. Mm. We get George Herbert Walker Bush as president. Uh, he's one of the more competent presidents we've ever had. He was a World War II vet. He was a senator. He was in the House. He was vice president. He was the CIA director. He was an amazing diplomat. Uh, but he struggled to connect with the American people in the same way Reagan did. And if you've ever seen Bush give speeches, I'll, I'll see if I can post some stuff. But uh, Dana Carvey on SNL does some, some amazing Bush impressions. So um, Google uh, George Bush SNL and take a look at some of those because they're just they're fantastic. So 
George Herbert Walker Bush, a uh, really intelligent guy, not the most charismatic individual. Uh, he struggles to deal with a series of problems. Uh, the gang crisis and the drug crisis really explodes in the late 1980s. Uh, crime rates are skyrocketing in urban areas during this time period, specifically because of the rise of a new drug known as uh, crack cocaine. And uh, man, maybe maybe I should post it some videos. Anyway, anyway, it's not. Crack cocaine is a formulation of cocaine. Uh, cocaine is, of course, uh, you know, a, a stimulant that's was produced pr predominantly in Latin America and then smuggled into the United States. Uh, the, the thing about crack cocaine that is terrifying is it's uh, incredibly potent, right? It, it, uh, it hits apparently hits you incredibly fast, and then the high disappears within a couple hours, and an hour to a couple hours, and leaves you just desperate for more crack. So people and it's incredibly addictive, and so we have these. Um, we have a so you have a series of people who uh, take crack cocaine or are given it, right? And then they're left with an almost insatiable desire for more crack a couple hours later. And so you can see how this would lead people's lives to spiral out of control, and how this would become a big money maker for uh, illegal street gangs. Well, illegal, yeah. Anyway, so uh, here we see us, uh, and and it was sold generally in very small portions that were incredibly affordable. So uh, it was within the reach of basically everybody. And so uh, the Bush administration really empowers the DEA to go fight this both at home and also intervening in the countries where it was created, uh, you know, specifically Colombia, of course, is sort of the cocaine capitalist of America. So with this, we have the war, uh, this is called the war on drugs. So here we go. Uh, the DEA was dispatched to Colombia in order to uh, take down a number of these drug cartels, uh, including most famous, of course, uh, Pablo Escobar. And uh, we're significantly stepping up enforcement within the United States and going to be increasingly criminalizing possession and distribution of illegal drugs to try to get this under control. The long-term effect of this, of course, is the policy was continued through the Clinton administration and we get mass incarceration, which a lot of people argue did much more harm to American society than good. But I'll let you go and read about that and make your own decisions. I'm not going to try to weigh in on that. Uh, on the plus side for the Bush administration, we get the rise of personal computers in the 1980s. So computers become much more accessible. Computers, of course, have been around for a long time, but they were previously main, main, um, mainframe computers, very large, bulky things that were outside the price range of your average family. But in the 1980s, many families, including my family, were able to purchase a computer to have in your house, which was an amazing game changer. You guys cannot imagine how amazing it was to have a computer in your house. Obviously, the computer is going to significantly change people's lives. Uh, this is pre-internet days still, so, but it puts us on the path to being able to do things like this, where I can uh, do distance teaching for a significant portion of time, and most of you can access this content. So, Computer is absolute game changer. When we come back, uh, when we come back tomorrow, we'll focus on Bush's foreign policy, end the Cold War, and introduce Bill Clinton.